it's a joy to do this. This is our world, this is our community, these are the people, you are the people who will drive India forward. And in a way, the session today is about investing. We will discuss how to invest and make money in modern India, but also the session today. The session today is also that people like us are the drivers of change in modern India. People like us are building great companies, they're creating massive wealth, right? Wealth that is actually beyond comprehension for most people in India. They're building massive wealth, but they're doing so quietly. Awaaz nahi kar rahe They're doing so quietly. And in a way, what we need to appreciate is that people like us who are quietly building great companies, other people we should go and invest in. We invest in their companies, they are people like us, they grow, we benefit. And there's a bunch of people we need to avoid. I think all of us know who those people are, we need to avoid. Those people make a lot of awaaz. They make a lot of noise and those companies we seek to avoid. We'll discuss more sort of scientific ways of you know, ascertaining this, uh, who to back and who to avoid. But this journey, this journey that all of us are in together is a journey of community, of friendship, of solidarity amongst people who come from a certain milieu, a certain social strata, who have a certain set of values, a certain set of values which matter to them and those values we espouse in our investing, we espouse in our daily lives, right? So let's get into it. Let's understand the world that we came from, right? The India that we came from, and then we'll gradually move towards the India that we want to go towards. So this is the India I think most of us grew up. I'm, I'm 47, I can see a few, of a few people of my era and a few, a few more youngsters. For those of us who grew up in 80s India, this was our life, right? I remember when I had my, uh, I got my first watch, I was in class 8 and it was a HMT and I used to wind it up and I learned very quickly if you wind it up extra, it conks off, if you don't wind it up, it stops, right, it was sort of one of the first lessons in maintaining something on a daily basis. Uh, that TV is in ours, but our ECTV was very similar, our ECTV was very similar. My parents, believe it or not, booked a phone uh, four years in advance. The phone kabhi aaya hai nahi. We never got the phone. Uh, the phone used to come in the neighbor's house. We used to go and take the phone in the neighbor's house. My parents migrated from India long before there. Their phone arrived, right? And I think the ambassador car everybody has seen. Another very striking thing about growing up in 80s India was typically every month or other month, there'd be long newspaper articles or magazine articles. In those days, people read magazines, right? It sounds unbelievable now, but you'd, if you go to a railway station, you buy a magazine. And typically, the magazine article was either about a scam or about India losing comprehensively uh, uh, in some uh, sporting encounter, right? So there were lots of series on why we lost and in public view, you would see cricketers politicking after the loss. Uh, and that was, you know, was a very tough time. I wouldn't say demoralizing uh, era to grow up in, it was a tough era to grow up in. And, and the companies that dominated 80s India are the companies we have listed there. These are the top 10 companies from the Sensex as of 1990, right? And you can see uh, there's lots of companies making textiles, right? So not just Mafatlal and Century Textiles, but even Reliance and Grasse, primarily at that juncture, were making textiles, right? Polyester, viscose, etc. In fact, it was such an India where you could just make fertilizer and make it into the top 10 of the market, right? And if you look at the Sensex top 10 today, you'll only have two out of these companies in the top 10. Anybody wants to guess which two? Reliance, Reliance and one more. Unilever. Huh? Unilever and Reliance still in the top 10, baki log, top 10 se nikal gaya. There's still, most of them are still around, but they are vastly, vastly diminished companies, right? Because the era that we grew up in is very different from India today. Where is India today, right? Where, are, where is the country positioned? If you cut through the hype, right? Because the hype is of different sorts. The hype is a lot of, there's a, there's a political edge to the hype. If you cut through that, India today is very, very similarly placed to where America was roughly a century ago, right? So just to sort of put this in context, why am I saying this? In the 1860s, America went through civil war, right? A famous civil war, they killed each other. 1870s, they stopped fighting. 1880s, right? Incredibly, they built their railroad system, right? By 1884, they linked the East and the West Coast together. Uh, 1900, a man called Alexander Graham Bell invented the phone. So by 1900, these guys had telegraph, right? That also is quite remarkable. 1900, tak, they had telegraph across the country. 1908, the world's first produced, first mass produced motor car came along, the Model T Ford. And naturally, therefore, with a lag of around 20 years, they, they highwayed the whole country. Or by 1930s, they built their national highway, national highway network, right? So those 50 years, roughly 1880 to 1930, they joined up America. They networked the country. 
And by networking America, they changed the complexion of the economy. They changed the complexion of the country. Specifically, specifically, chota companies, local companies got wiped out. And national giants were born, right? You consolidated the economy. Uh, not just these brands. If you go back and check, leaving aside the technology brands, pretty much everything that we know America and associate America with was born in that, was created in that 50 years, 50 years ka era, right? So just to sort of take the example which is easiest to understand, right? Were, American having, were Americans having condiments and ketchups in the 1870s? Absolutely they were having it, right? But much like India today, where say achar, Achar in India is a local industry, right? Achar, there is no national Achar player. There is no national Agarbatti player, right? There is no national Mithai player, incredible as it sounds. These are very local industries in our country. America, Achar or uh, ketchup was a local industry in the 1870s. The most efficient ketchup manufacturer was Mr. Heinz. And therefore, as the country started joining up, right? And this is important to understand. It's actually quite intuitive. It's quite important to understand. As the country started getting joined up, better roads, cars, telegraph, etc. Mr. Hines said, this is a lot of fun. This is so much fun. He would just go to the adjacent area where he dominated. These guys come from Pittsburgh. The Hines family still, I think, is based in Pittsburgh. They went to the adjacent area and said, uh, look, Mr. Adjacent Area Ketchup Manufacturer, you have a choice in life. You either sell that company to me, or I destroy you financially because I am more cash. I'm generating more cash. I have a more powerful business, right? And therefore, by 1930, one company dominated ketchup and it was Heinz and say ditto for breakfast cereal and Kellogg's. And if you go back and check, chewing gum and Wrigley's is very similar, right? That fundamentally is what economic development is about. A lot of people think economic development is capex and GDP growth and so on. What's up outcome? Hai. Fundamentally, economic development is when you join up a country, when you join up a nation, the, the, the efficient player ends up spreading his or her wings and the efficient player takes over the whole sector, right? And that's what my colleagues and I came to India to do and thankfully, it's working to plan, right? India has been transformed over the past decade. This, I'm not making some political statement. It's a straightforward point of view. The first and obvious piece for those of us who drove through the metro uh, construction this morning, most of us drove through the metro construction this morning. In the last 10 years, we have built twice as much infrastructure as we did in the first 60 years of independence, right? It's a straightforward point. If you build, if you double the highway network, you have commute times, you have journey times. If a truck travels twice as fast and without any GST blockages, the working capital cycle, the number of days, uh, uh, the goods are stuck inside the truck reduces, that's more cash flow, right? So first, an obvious layer of development is you've doubled the, the physical infrastructure and this is not going to stop regardless of which government is running which state, expediting physical infrastructure has become a big priority for our, for our polity. Second is, what we have done in terms of tax reform is quite remarkable, right? I studied economic history at the LSE. I have never seen a country change its tax system at this speed and ironically without that much halla gulla, right? So everybody knows about GST. 2017 when GST uh, uh, unified the indirect tax system. Right? Till GST came along, remember, till GST came along, each state was a little market by itself and you integrated the tax system. Then in September 2019, I thought a remarkable change took place. I thought it was a far more important change than people understood it. The finance minister cut the, the corporate tax rate from 35 to 25, right? It's a big change, right? And then in the recent budget, I thought an even bigger change took place where the default mode of tax filing for most people became the, the simplified system, right? And this is actually very interesting. Most important changes in India don't actually get commented upon. They fly under the radar and it's the nature of Indian life, both in business and in policy, the important stuff will not be hyped up, right? And that's where you and I need to switch our radar on. The important stuff will not be in the headlines. The important stuff will be in the detail. And therefore, you know, in a way, investing in India, if you want to do it our way, is about switching your mind on to understand the, the subtext, the detail, rather than the big picture. The big picture usually that you'll get on the front pages of papers will be a smokescreen. The real stuff will be happening in the background. The real stuff in the budget was effectively, she nudged the country towards a very different income tax system and I think a better income tax system. The old system of year exemption, work exemption is gradually going to become history, right? Let's move forward to banking reform, right? This has been epic, right? Again, it's flown under the radar. Basically, eight or nine years ago, uh, our banking system was effectively broken, 
right? Around 200 to 300 billion dollars had been taken out by power and infra promoters. That money had disappeared. It had broken the banking system. Small businesses found it very difficult to get loans in 2015, 16. I remember, at great cost, your taxpayers' money, our our shareholders, our our money as shareholders, great cost. The banking system has been repaired. Serious legislative reform has happened in the background. The, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Act is a big deal. It's not a joke. It's not perfect, but it's working reasonably well. And in that regard, the, the fact that courtesy Jandhan, the number of bank accounts have trebled in the country is also a big deal. right? Uh, on the one hand, your, your, the bank, banks have more capital to lend. The borrower fears insolvency because of, of the Insolvency Act. On the other hand, deposit taking also has to increase. And for that, trebling the number of bank accounts played a big role. And then that links directly to the India stack. And the link between banking and the India stack is, is UPI. Right? So uh, 14 years ago, Nandan Nilekani quit his job at Infosys to set up Aadhaar. Right? He joined the government, set up Aadhaar. By 2015, we had 1.5 billion Indians on Aadhaar. By 2015, those Aadhaar IDs had got mapped to bank accounts. Uh, by when 2016, uh, uh, Reliance announced uh, 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 Geo and cheap broadband. UPI was announced on the back of that. NPCI came and announced UPI. Today, 52% of national income goes through UPI. It's an unbelievable stat. 52% of national income goes through a peer-to-peer -peer payment system, which is what's effectively four years old, right? Through COVID, it's gained traction. Every month, every month, we are doing 7 billion. We as a group are doing 7 billion peer-to-peer -peer transactions. There is nothing like it anywhere else in the world, right? This, has, this is a game changer at many levels. Uh, at some other session, we can get into the details of it. But the crux of what I'm driving at is, both from a physical perspective, physical infrastructure, and from a a uh, uh, financial and tax perspective, you have slammed the country together. Most small businesses that I meet now think national. Small businesses no longer think that I'm operating in Mahalakshmi, so my client base is Mahalakshmi. That I'm operating in Bombay, my client base is Bombay. And because small businesses think national, and because obviously larger businesses are, are going national, it's changing the nature of it's changing the nature of competitive advantage in India. Right? The way business thinks, the way you and I need to think about competitive advantage is fundamentally changed. Right? And we're going to discuss the implications of this for investing, but first let's take it step by step. Let's start with the obvious piece. After Geo made data really cheap, after Geo dropped the cost of data, and, and my apologies, I think uh, the cost of data has dropped even further in recent months. We haven't been able to capture that. I reckon Geo has dropped the cost of uh, broad uh, mobile data by order of say order of eight or nine x. So 80, 90 percent drop in the cost of mobile data has happened in the space of six years, right? Naturally, if you make data cheaper, the use of mobile data takes off. It rockets through, and you can see on the chart on the top left, right? Mobile data rockets as soon as it becomes cheaper. Today, we generate as a nation more mobile data than any other continent in the world. Forget country. No other continent generates as much mobile data. And remember, th remember this is happening with 45% smartphone penetration. Right? Imagine when smartphone penetration goes to 65%, what's going to happen? Now, the challenge with this is not all businesses can tap into this mobile data for profit equally. You need to be well capitalized. You need to also have smart people running the business. Right? Data is easy to access. You can go and buy it. I can go and buy it. But to tap into that data, to mine that data, to use that data to make money is not an easy thing to do, right? And what's happening is a small group of very smart companies are, are mining data incredibly effectively, but almost to a man, to a woman, those smart companies that are mining data effectively are keeping their mouths shut. They're not shouting out from the rooftops, right? And I can understand why they're keeping them out shut. In their place, I would have done the same thing, right? So first thing to understand is how has, how has data changed the nature of competitive advantage? And then figuring out which companies are using data the best to make the most amount of money. One hint that, and I'll give you and we'll elaborate on this, is the companies who say they are using data very effectively, the, the indications are that, that they're not actually. Those who are using data effectively are keeping their mouths very tightly shut and their profits, you can see, are zipping through the roof because of the ability to capitalize on, on the fact that all of our mobile phones are spewing off data every single day. So that's the first change in competitive advantage, right? 
Let's come to cost of capital. The cost of capital in India has fallen very sharply over the last 20 years. So 20 years ago, had we met, I would have told you the 10-year government of India bond yield is 13%. Today, it is pushing 7%, right? Six percentage points drop, right? Now, think about it. If you have a country where the government is borrowing at 13, and say a decent business is borrowing at 15, if you're borrowing at, say, 18, 19, that's not a big deal, because you're not that disadvantaged, right? So in a country where cost of capital is high, if yours is a little higher, chalta hai, it's all right, you'll, you'll survive. But in a country where the government is borrowing at seven, and say Bajaj Finance is borrowing at seven, if you're borrowing at 10, you're gonna struggle. You're gonna really struggle, right? So as the cost of capital drops, ironically, as the cost of capital drops, for those businesses who are, whose cost of capital is even a little bit higher, the disadvantage in absolute terms is far greater. Right? So for today, for a small, small NBFC to com compete with, say, Bajaj Finance for, or for a small bank to compete with HDFC Bank is much harder than was the case 10 years ago. Right? And this cost of capital as a source of competitive advantage will carry on, I think, becoming more important because the cost of capital, I reckon, will keep dropping. As all of you start financializing your wealth or as you, as you continue financializing your wealth, the cost of capital where we are at 7, the bond deal is at 7, I reckon will go to 3 to 4. Three to four a decade hence, and again, those companies whose cost of capital is higher will fall further and further behind, right? And the last aspect, let's come back to tax again, right? The tax pieces become critical. So, so remember the FM cut the direct tax rate, she cut the corporate tax rate from 35 to 25 in September 19. And yet, as she said in the budget recently, Corporate tax divided by GDP, direct tax divided by GDP, total tax divided by GDP, all of them are at all-time highs. Right? In fact, tax collections, at, at the central government level, tax collections are growing twice as fast as GDP. Now, that's the, that's the official message. It's a correct message. But you and I need to understand the consequences of that. Because all of us know there's an ecosystem of businesses in India which existed because they did tax arbitrage. So if you go to the Ministry of Corporate Affairs site, the official data is roughly 8 lakh businesses are shutting down in India every year. I suspect most of them are shutting down because the tax arbitrage is, is gone. Right? You couldn't, you, you know, if, you, if you do the rough back, uh, back of the envelope maths, you can have a 25% profit margin business without paying tax and it will become a 0% profit margin business with tax. Right? So those businesses are shutting down. The official number is 8 lakhs. I reckon the real number in terms of practically how many businesses are being uh, uh, thrown out of gear by, by tax collection, I would say is around 20 to 30 lakhs between that number, right? Massive number. Now, all of that market share, all of that market share is moving, right? I'm buying a relaxo chappal, I could have bought an informal sector chappal. I'm buying a jockey car t-shirt, I would have, could have bought an informal sector t-shirt, right? And you can see that, you can see that shift coming through. Market share shifting from the part of India that avoided tax to the part of India that pays tax. Now, this is just the beginning of the story. We are at 12% tax to GDP. Southeast Asian, East Asian countries are at 15. I cannot see how India can avoid going to 15. We will have to go to 15% tax to GDP. As we do that, even more small businesses will, will go under. And even more market share will shift, whether it's in chappal or t-shirt or, or uh, uh, plastic pipes or paint, etc., etc. Right. So that's the third way that the economy has changed, right? The result of all this at one level is quite simple. The result is obviously polarization of profitability in the country. So if you look at the chart on the left, uh, the, the Uparwala text is about how that polarization is happening, the commentary I just gave you. If you look at the chart on the bottom left, right? Um, around 14, 15 years ago, when my colleagues and I migrated to this country, if you see the black line, the black line is telling you 14, 15 years ago, the top 20 companies in India, largest 20 companies in India, controlled around 30-40% of the nation's profits. That was 2008-9 when we rocked up here. Today, if you drag the number out, you look at the black line. Obviously, during COVID, the black line went above 100, right? Because during COVID, small businesses made a loss. And therefore, the top 20 businesses' share of profits went above 100. After COVID, as you can see, the black line has normalized, right? It's actually very interesting how, how, how quickly the black line has normalized. But today, the 20 largest businesses in India are making between 72 80% of India's profitability. It is remarkable. This polarization has been super fast. 
right? I've worked in India for 14 years. Even I couldn't have predicted. I knew this was going to happen because I read what had happened in America. But this is blazingly fast, right? And because it is blazingly fast, the stock market is not able to fully discount it, right? Now, this is an important slide. In a way, the whole of our lives is in this one slide. So I'll I'll pause here and I'll do something. And this will be a real experiment for me as well, right? I have not done this I'll do this with you. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of data and then we'll do a small quiz, right? A quiz more like a market research exercise. So here's the data. In the 10 years ending 2022, in the 10 years ending 2022, the Indian stock market created 105 trillion rupees of wealth. Okay, simple data. You just take the Nifty 10 years pehle, Nifty today. In 10 years ending 2022, the Indian stock market created 105 trillion rupees of wealth. Next piece of data, 80% of that wealth was created by 20 giant companies. Right? Not surprising given what you're seeing here, the, the, the pre preceding slide, I showed you the polarization, no? So if obviously profits are polarizing, naturally therefore, naturally therefore, uh, 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 wealth creation also polarizes. 80% of that 105 trillion came from 20 companies. And this is very easy, there's no science here, you just take 10 years pehle, aaj, if I gave you that list of 20 companies, the 20 companies that have killed it in the last 10 years, you and I will say two out of the 20 are crony capitalists, right? It's difficult to call the other 18 crony capitalists. Right? Other 18 are companies like HDFC Bank, TCS, Infosys, Asian Paints, right? And everybody who sort of follows Marcellus knows these names, right? And these are companies who have used business processes, enterprise, uh, 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 proprietary technology, etc., to make money. Now, here is the quiz. Here is the quiz. I don't need to tell you the names of the crony capitalists. I think everybody in the room knows that. So no point getting into that. Let's do the other side, the, the side that takes India forward. Okay? So let's do Bajaj Finance. Bajaj Finance has compounded wealth 60x in the last 10 years. Right? 60x in the last 10 years. Who here can, if you know the name of the CEO of Bajaj Finance, raise your hand. The name of the CEO of Bajaj Finance. One hand, just raise your hand. Don't you want to say anything? One, two, three. Three hands, four hands. So this, this is Rashaj. How many people in the room, Yashraj? 102. So 4% of people in the room know the Bajaj Finance. 5% people know the Bajaj Finance. You know. Right? Remember this guy? He used to be my neighbor. His name is Rajiv Jain. He has built a money machine par excellence, 60x compounding. Hard-working guy, 7 a.m. in the morning till 8 p.m., 13 hours a day. He works six days a week, right? Incredible, incredible guy. Uh, but, you know, 5% of Mumbai's intelligentsia knows his name, right? And you guys are the intelligentsia. No jokes about it. You get, really are, right? Now, let's do another one. Let's do a company whose products most of you would have bought, which has created 330x wealth in the last 20 years. The company is called Titan. Titan, everybody's heard, no? Okay, now here comes the question. Raise your hand if you know the name of the CEO of Titan. Four, six, six, eight. This is better. Nine people, ten people. So CK Venkatraman, 10% of the room knows the name of the CEO of Titan, right? 330x wealth compounding, right? Let's do another one. Asian paints, right? As everybody knows, my favorite example, and I'll you'll see in a minute why. 82 IPO, uh, I think by now around 2,500 or 2,800x wealth creation, 10x in the last 10 years, but 2,800x wealth creation. Raise your hand if you know the name of the CEO of Asian Paints. One, two, three, there's again nine, ten percent. That's good, ten percent. Amit Singhle is the name of the CEO of Asian Paints. You can see what I'm driving at, right? These are the companies who have defined modern India. That out of that 20 names, the two crony capitals everybody knows, I'm sure you could name Sabka Naam Hape. Right? 18 out of 20 companies, the defining narrative of modern India, 18 out of 20 companies, most of us uh, affluent, educated people, these pe the CEOs are unknown. Amit Singhle, CK Venkatraman, Rajiv Jain, Sashi Jagdishan at HDFC Bank. These are the sort of poster boys, poster girls, they should be of modern India. But they are, they deliberately stay under the radar. Because they stay under the radar, it gives you and me an incredible opportunity to make money. Okay, this is Superman, but he pretends to be Clark Kent. This is Spider-Man, but he pretends to be Peter Parker. 
right? And in a, I suppose uh, uh, if you see those uh, comic book characters as metaphors, these, the, the, the CEOs I spoke about and many more, they are the, the metaphors that we need to focus on. Now, how does it link to your and my making money, right? So, so we have a, a gentleman called Krishnan, he's our quant guru. Uh, he's helped us quantify things that people used to think about, but his ability, his ability to tease out, tease out uh, uh, quant insights is mind blowing. So year and a half ago, year or so ago, he built this chart for us, right? I'll talk you through the chart and then I'll give you the power of what this chart is telling us. This chart is telling you what the future holds for us in one slide. So um, we can go back say to 2003, we can go back 20 years and look at data. We can, we've got 20 years of financial statement data in great detail for thousands of companies. Okay, easy. You can go to buy a database, you can buy it. So let's go back in time to June 2003. Right? We are back in June 2003, the financial year 03. FY03 has ended in March 03. June 03, the results are gaya hai. We got the results for FY03. And what you and I can do is say, let's look back at the preceding year, identify companies who are above average on two on two fronts. Firstly, their profitability, matlab return on capital, profitability as measured by return on capital. Return on capital is simple, profit divided by how much capital is invested in the business. So we go back in time, we go back to June 03, we say which are the companies in the prior year whose profitability, ROCE is above average. Okay, you get a list of say 50 or 60 companies. Uh, by the way, above average does not mean symmetric. Right? So, uh, the average tends to be a dispersed number. So I went to school in Delhi in the 80s. There were uh, 50 bachas in the class. 10 of us used to study, 40 people used to party. So the 10 of us dragged up the average mark. So the above average was only 10, 10 out of 50 bachas, 20% of the class. Right? And ROC is similar. Right? ROC is similar. Average ke aspas is not symmetric. Above average tends to be only around, around 20% of the population. So assume you have, you have a 40, 50 companies or above average on rookie. Then we say we also want to identify companies whose growth is higher than, higher than uh, average, right? Rather than measuring growth, we use something called reinvestment rate. Reinvestment rate is what percentage of your operating cash flows are you investing back in the dhanda? In accounting terms, investing cash flow divided by operating cash flow. How much of the business ka paisa are you slamming back into the business, right? So we want you to be above average on reinvestment because that will give you growth. And we want to be above average on return capital because that's a measure of profitability. So typically we find sitting in June 03 that roughly 20 companies pass the test. Okay? And then we build back in June 03 an equal weighted portfolio and let it run. We let it rip for 10 years and we write down the result. We repeat the process in June 04. June 04 again we sit, look at the preceding fiscal, identify companies who are above average on reinvestment and growth equal weighted portfolio, again, 15-20 company companies, you identify them and you let them rip for 10 years. And you do it year after year, 2006, 5, 6, 7, 8. And what you find is remarkable. You find that final stack, which where I've highlighted in, in, in that uh, dotted line, dashed line, right? What do you find? Is that these above average companies, year after year, these above average companies are growing their cash flows. They're, we call them free cash flows. Free cash flows means cash flow after doing capex. You've run your business, generated some cash, you've added to your plant and capacity and factory, factory, and you find that the free cash flow, the residual, is growing at 22% for these above average businesses. Remember, this is best part of 20 years of data. This is pretty reliable data. Consistently, India's best businesses, above average business, above average on two fronts, Roki and reinvestment, grow cash flows at 22%. But here comes the, the killer piece, which makes living in India, working in India, so much, so much, and so, so very interesting. The share prices of these companies compound at 17%. Right? You can see that there. Cash flow grow at 22, cash flow growing at 22, share price growing at 17. Every year we identified the above average businesses, where we therefore by definition have also identified the rest of the country, the average businesses, let's call them, let's not call them below average, unko bhi demoralize nahi karna. let's call them average businesses, right? So every year we can run the same process on average businesses, let buy the average stocks in 2003, let it rip for 10 years, buy the average stocks in 2004, let it rip for 10 years, five, right, let it rip for 10 years. If you do that, you get the Nietzsche wala, the, the lower stack, which is that, 
free cash flow growth for the average businesses is a mere 9%, basically nominal GDP, right? Free cash flow growth for the average businesses is 9%, but their share price compounding is 14%, 5% zada, right? 5% zada. You guys can see what's happening, right? The, the businesses that are doing a really good job of growing the business but keeping their mouth shut, they're doing a really good job of growing the business but keeping their mouth shut, they are not getting the full whack that they deserve. Because, you know, we, I did the experiment with you, no? I did it live. I told you about India's greatest companies, biggest money machines, and maximum 10% of the room knew the names of these people. Right? They don't want to be known. Their goal is to run a great franchise. They have no desire to publicize themselves. Buy cricket teams, we are in page three, no interest. They just want to run a great business. And as a result, you and I are able to identify businesses who are growing cash flows at 22. Right? Not every year, at the business level, there is a little bit of noise, but at the aggregate level, you get a pretty smooth signal. But the market rewards the fellows who make the most noise. And the market therefore overvalues the average business, undervalues the, the superior business. Right? We, we wrote a book called Unusual Billionaires uh, in 2016. Uh, in a way, the book was about such businesses. We're trying to write Unusual Billionaires too. Time permitting, we'll be able to uh, give you Unusual Billionaires too next year. Now, the goal of the rest of the session, the goal of the rest of the session is to, is to help you guys make money from these businesses, right? How can you do it? We'll take you through Two, two processes to do it, right? I'll keep talking about the natural sort of qualitative approach that we have talked about for many years. It's sort of second nature to us, so it's easy for me to talk about. However, I've realized over the last three years, it's hard for you guys, especially those who are not full-time investors, to do this because the sheer extent of research required, right? We have 20 very smart analysts, five full-time fund managers, four traders doing this. So naturally for us, it's an army of people. Uh, are doing this uh, a ton of work. So I'll talk you through it so that you get a sense of the, 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 the qualitative approach as well. Our book, Diamonds in the Dust, gives you further details of the qualitative approach. But I'll also give you in parallel a simplified way to do this using simple, simple metrics. It, I won't call it a shortcut, but it's it, for someone who's interested in investing, wants to do his or her own thing, they can, they can adopt this approach to good effect. Uh, we've done it uh, in parts of our business and it seems to be working for us. So I thought I'll also share that method with you, right? So, so the, the underlying inspiration from this comes from Atul Gawande's lovely book, The Checklist Manifesto, right? So I read it, I think, 11 or 12 years ago. It had a big effect on my life and I was stunned to read that. I knew that in planes, the pilot uses checklists, right? Because you can see, if you sit in that front row of planes, you can see their ma manuals, right? Most planes, you'll see the pilot's manual. It's like, like a phone, Purane Zamane ka phone book, and it's pretty dog-eared, and it'll have a ring, ring binder, and the pages will be curled at the margin, because even for stuff like how to take off, how to take off, uh, 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 how to land, they follow the checklist. They don't just say, Mereko pata, and they, you know, slam the plane down in Goa or something like that. They follow a checklist, right? Uh, but I didn't know that even in surgeries, checklists uh, ha are increasingly used and they're very effective. So, so in that book, in Gawande's book, he, he points out something as basic as line infections. Line infections, hai, say when you get a catheter, right, when you get a catheter, uh, um, often uh, the process of using the catheter ends up giving the patient an infection, right? And that's obviously damaging for anti-infection anti drugs and it weakens the patient. So in the book, he explains that a simple bunch of checklists improves the hygiene, improves the, the, the reduces the risk of uh, infections, line infections associated with using things like uh, catheters, right? I think the 70% the drop in infections from using a checklist about, you know, basic stuff, nurse uh, washing his or her hands, uh, uh, using antiseptics in the right way and so on. So we said, why don't, why not create a checklist for, for investing, right? Because uh, for us, investing is our life. It, it's a, there's a great deal of money at stake. Why not create a checklist for investing? So the checklist I'm going to talk you through will have five relatively simple steps in it, right? So I'll give you the steps. First step, first step in India, as you'd expect, is get the naughty people out of the picture, right? Use forensic accounting, get the naughties out of the picture, right? Remember, they will make every effort to get into your portfolio, right? You'll be hearing about them all the time. 
मीडिया में होंगे दर बी ब्रोकर रिसर्च पर हैप्स योर एडवाइजर विल ऑल्सो कॉल अप टू से सर अच्छा लग रहा है ले लीजिए राइट बट द फर्स्ट स्टेप हैज टू बी यू हैव टू बी योर गेट कीपर इन हाउ टू कीप द नॉट इज आउट ऑफ योर आउट ऑफ योर पोर्टफोलियो राइट वी विल डिस्कस हाउ सम स्टेप्स यू यू कैन यूज टू डू दैट सेकेंड स्टेप अवॉइड कंपनीज विथ लेवरेज अवॉइड कंपनीज ऑफ बोरोड अ लॉट ऑफ मनी राइट दर्ज अ there is a double reason for avoiding companies which have borrowed a lot of money firstly the cost of borrowing tends to be quite high even if you are a big industrial house big conglomerate in india if you borrow a lot of money the banks start hitting you with 8 9% interest rates once a promoter has paid and remember these are large promoters paying 8 9 once a promoter pays 8 9 and a mid size company pays 10 11% interest rates what's left on the table for you is quite modest and there's a further challenge a deeper issue if a company is having to borrow to finance growth that means it's a low return on capital business right if a company is having to borrow to finance growth that means the engine itself the business engine itself is relatively weak right and therefore no point you know uh, uh, going and going out there and buying a 800 cc purane zamane ka maruti car right uh, it looks jazzed up it's like uh, you know those souped up cars from the outside when we were growing up in delhi in the 80s there used to be a lot of this my friends would have 800 cc marutis but it would look like a ferrari from the outside right so these businesses which are trying to pretend to be bigger than they are they will borrow a lot of money but their engine will be very weak and there's this plenty of them in our country right giant businesses with very weak engines and the measure of the engine in cars you do kitna bada liter ka engine hai kitna liter ka engine hai in business you look at roc ROC is a good measure of engine mein kitna dam hai right so if you have a combination of low leverage and good ROC so third step is consistent profitability look for good rokis ROC operating profit divided by business mein kitna paisa hai the fourth step is if you've got so far you've got a business which is clean leverage kam hai low leverage good roki and now you say I want this to be at sensible price to free cash flow multiples, not PE. PE does not work, right? What works is price to free cash flow. For the free cash flow that I am paying for, what is the price of the business, right? And remember, typically, typically higher ROKI businesses will have higher price to free cash flow. The ratio is quite simple. If a business, a business at forty percent ROC, can command a higher, a four times higher multi- multiple than a business at ten percent ROC. right so if you have a business at 40% roc don't don't expect to be trading don't expect it to be trading at the same multiple at as a business at 10% roc there's a uh, there's a paper on our website called why pe multiples are deceptively dangerous just google marcellus why pe multiples are deceptively dangerous read that paper we have explained this maths there right uh, all all the all our research is free we not we don't going to stick cookies or anything into your into a machine the research is there so that other people can benefit from it right so fourth step look for businesses with price to free cash flow multiples which are attractive and the final step right something that we do using qualitative means you can use do, you can use quantitative means i'll give you a few ways to do it the the more the price to free cash flow drops the more the price to free cash flow drops the higher your position size right so remember you identify decent businesses already don't just go run out there and look for sasta price to free cash flow you'll most probably end up investing in chore companies go out there say i want clean on accounting low leverage good roki in the context of that roc given that higher roc businesses tend to have higher pre- price to free cash flow multiple in the context of that roc low price to free cash flow and if the price to free cash flow falls further i will buy more of it right this is the process we do it qualitatively and quantitatively i'm going to talk you through both processes i reckon it'll be easier for you to do it quantitatively right but i'll talk you through both now let's look at the results for a minute right so broadly speaking what we're trying to show you is had we followed this process for the last 16 years 16 years ago i wasn't here but suppose i had been here 16 years ago had we been doing this at marcellus for 16 years roughly roughly 1 lakh investment in 2006 would have become 20 lakhs today this has given 20x return in the last 16 years right so so you, so 20x returns uh, in the last 16 years in kagar terms you are looking at around 21 21% 21% returns over the 16 year period right now the breakdown is important right the detail of the breakdown is really important so 16 years ago 
had you and I bought the BSC 500 equal weighted. Right? Had we bought each stock in the BSC 500 equal weighted and we repeated this process every year for 16 years, our return would be a mere 8%. Right? That's how weak the index is actually. Right? Remember the indices are market cap weighted, so you end up thinking Tera Chauda, Tera Chauda, 13, 14. But if you equal weight the index as a measure of the power of the index, the index actually, whether it's Nifty or BSE 500, the index itself is not actually very powerful. Right? So equal weighting the BSE 500 would have given us a 8% return over 16 years. Now, we bring in the forensic layer. You get the chores out of the picture. You get the crooks out of the picture, immediately the return jumps to 13 and a half. Right, around 5.6% kicker. This is the biggest kicker in the process. I'll show it to you in two different ways. The biggest kicker, the biggest kicker to return in India is get the crooks out of the picture. Get the crooks out of the index. Right? So step one, equal weight the index. Step two, get the crooks out, equal weight the rest. Now, out of the rest, the remaining guys who are clean, you're knocking off. You remove the fellows with high leverage. You remove the fellows with high leverage and you remove the fellows with high, with, uh, with low profitability. You remove the companies with high leverage and low profitability. Okay? You are now left with companies which are clean, uh, uh, don't have debt, and have good profitability. That gives you returns of around the 21% mark. Right? So we started at 8, we have reached 21 so far. Then you pull in price to free cash flow. You say that amongst these companies, I will load up heavily on the ones with low price to free cash flow, and that juices up your returns by another 1%, you get to roughly 22. So you started at eight, step by step, you peel the onion, step by step you peel the onion to get to 22, right? And you can see that the red line, uh, uh, the red line gives you a sense of how this, how this story unfolds, right? Now, let's start with the, the detail a little bit. So in Diamonds in the Dust, chapter two gives you the, all the ratios we use as a checklist, right? So there's a, fine, there's a forensic accounting checklist. Uh, 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 the, the entire thing is given in chapter two. I'm going to give you just six ratios in the interest of time, right? Because uh, we also have to uh, meet the, uh, we also have to give you the, the crux of the approach without getting into the details, right? The first and most important forensic ratio is called cash conversion ratio. So you take a company's operating cash flow, that's the numerator, in the denominator is operating profit. Operating cash flow upar, operating cash flow niche. This is called the cash conversion ratio. For every 100 rupees of operating profit, how much cash flow is the promoter generating? The reason this is a almost like godlike powerful ratio is, this is the most easy measure of chori in, in, in forensic accounting. Typically what promoters do is, if they want to juice up the stock, because they know most people look at PE multiples, they fudge the earnings. They basically boost the earnings through naughty means, right? So they will st they will declare revenue which is not really revenue. If you declare dodgy revenue, fraudulent revenue, obviously your profits are also fraudulent, right? And the way to spot it is to check the cash flow and say cash flow RINE. Now, if you want to be cleverer about it, you take a company and compare it to the peer group, right? Now I'm going to tell you something which will help you hopefully avoid a blow up, which I think will come in the next couple of years. This has helped us repeatedly in India avoid, avoid naughty companies, right? I've lost count of how many times. So Amtec Auto, one of the reasons uh, 10 years ago we were able to see through it is this ratio was super weak for Amtec compared to other ancillaries. There's a large pharma company in South India heading for a blow up. It's inside many Indian portfolios, right? And it's heading for a blow up and you can see it by looking at the CFO EBITDA. That pharma company's operating cash flow is weak relative to its operating profit. That ratio is weak compared to the rivals. And if you do the forensic flow through, you probably won't have the resources, but you, if you go and check this large pharma company, it's a very large pharma company, right? Uh, uh, you see the weak cash flow, the weak cash conversion, and that's a very powerful sign that this is gonna be, this is gonna be a big uh, a troublesome story, right? Um, you know, this, this, this happens in, in, in uh, emerging market stock markets with metronomic regularity. It happened in America as well. It happens in Japan as well, right? There's nothing new here. Use this as your first kind of, this is your kind of, uh, your, your king in forensic accounting. Then the next piece to look at is uh, provisioning for, for debtors, right? So remember a company, almost every company will have some clients who don't pay up on time. Right? So they'll be provisioning for these doubtful debtors. 
A company says that I've got say 100 crores outstanding where clients are yet to pay me. But I know from my past experience that around 2% nahi dega paisa. 2% is not gonna come through. So that company should provision 2 crores. That 2 crores is a hit to, is a hit to the company's profitability. When a company doesn't do that, right? When a company doesn't provision for doubtful debtors, right? And you can see debtors, the debtor number is big. The receivables number, receivables of debtors is revenue yet to come into the bank. You can see the receivable number is big, but there's no provisioning for it. That's a killer, right? That's almost, that's almost, you know, you can almost see the ding, 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 khatre ki ghanti going off in your head. So there's a wind power company. There's one wind power company which is already gone. There's another wind power company where this khatre ki ghanti is going full blast, right? It's been going for a few while, right? Which, which means that this is an indication that the company is declaring revenues which are actually, which are actually overstated, right? And he knows, the promoter knows that the revenues are overstated, which is why he's not setting aside a provision for the naughty stuff, right? Um, the third, third one is every company has cash on the balance sheet or they should have cash they will have on the balance sheet on the balance sheet you'll see how much cash or bonds uh, or fds they have in the in the business on the face of the pnl you should see how much treasury income interest income uh, the company is declaring right so the interest income is in the pnl the cash is on the balance sheet divide one by the other the interest income by the cash to get a sense of how much is the company earning on the cash right if Average Joes like us can earn 7% on our FDs uh, and, and large corporates can earn 5-6% easily on, on time deposits. Then the, a reasonably well-run company should be getting 4-5% four, four, in the current day and age on the cash on the books. If that number is 1 or 2, that usually suggests the cash is not there. Right? So what companies very cleverly do is to show the auditor, they bring the cash in on the last day of the of the reporting period, right? And therefore, the, the cash doesn't earn the whole inter, in, interest income, right? But that practice over many years suggests something very naughty happening. Some years, you can, you, you, it's justified. If some years the money came in very late in the year, naturally, the interest income on the PNL will be lower than uh, the, the five, four, 5% five mark. But if every year, every year you're earning one, two, one, two, one, two, that means the cash is usually not there which is again a khatre ki, a, a danger signal, right? Um, let's go to one ratio which turned out to be a lifesaver for us for the first five, six years I lived in India. It's called contingent liabilities, right? Contingent liabilities are uh, uh, companies' liabilities. See, on, on balance sheet liabilities is debt. Off balance sheet liabilities is, these are challenges, financial hits that the company might face in the years ahead. Right? So by law, you are supposed to declare them. So, so for example, if you are in a fight with the income tax department, uh, you are arbitrating or you are in arbitration or in the courts, the tax man is saying pay up 1000 crores and you are disputing that, then you are supposed to announce, you are supposed to say in the annual report, contingent liabilities of 1000 crores. And you can, you, you and I see that number, we divide that by the net worth to get a sense of how grave the situation is. But say for a bank, for a bank, uh, a bank writes bank guarantees and letters of credit, right? Everybody knows what bank guarantees are, right? A bank guarantees that Saurabh Mukherjee is good for this 500 crores. If Saurabh defaults on the 500 crores, I, the bank, will make good the money. So the bank has to say these are these are these are contingent liabilities. If Saurabh Mukherjee defaults, I will have to pay up. The bank says I will have to pay up to say whoever is Saurabh's counterparty is the X amount of money in the event of Saurabh's default. So the RBI compels the banks to declare that as a contingent liability. Now, what you and I can do is take that figure and divide it by network to see kitna bada hai. How big is the contingent liability, right? So when I came to India at right, 2008, 9, 10, my colleagues and I we used to see that it's a decent, well-run bank, say HDFC Bank, Kotak Bank, their contingent liabilities to net worth were five times, sometimes six times, no more than that. But we used to open Yes Bank's accounts and I remember this all through the all the way until Yes Bank ran aground and then uh, the RBI had to engineer a rescue. Their number used to be 30, 40, 50 times, right? And we used to think, boss, how can this be happening in the same country? One bank is saying contingent liabilities are 50 times the net worth. The other bank is saying five times, right? And it's not as if you know the people at Kotak are not smart. They're also smart. Why wouldn't they write this, right? Remember, when a bank writes a BG, they get a fee income. 
right? And the most interesting part, I can't sort of, I can't explain it to you. In the context of the heavy duty contingent liabilities Yes Bank was writing, the fee income was not commensurate, right? And I used to look at that thing, ki kaise ho ka, yaar? it's happening in broad daylight, why isn't something, doing something about this, right? So you can see, you could, we would stack up all the banks in India, contingent liabilities net worth on one axis, fee income as a personal total income. Now, if you write heavy duty contingent liabilities, it's your right as a banker, aapne likha hai. But you should earn the fee income, no? And we would get really bemused and nobody would seem to bother and they would be going and buying. Yes, bank shares, right? So contingent liabilities to net worth, important figure, look out for it, right? Next piece, CVIP to gross block. So I'll, I'll explain this product slowly. Um, one standard way to steal money in India is to say you're building a factory. Rather than building, you tell the shareholders I'm building a 100 crore ka factory. Actually, you build a 10 crore ka factory and you steal 90 crores, right? So it's as simple as that, right? You give the contract to your brother-in-law's cousin, uh, to build the factory, he invoices the list co, 100 CR, but actually builds a little hut, which is probably 1 CR, and 99 CR you take out to, uh, to some offshore tax haven and party there, right? So, so people like us use, uh, uh, use uh, uh, we look at revenues as a percent, uh, revenues as a proportion of gross block, it's called asset turnover, revenues as a proportion of gross block to see whether this naughtiness is happening. And as night follows day, lots of large Indian companies do naughtiness here. For the gross block, for the fixed assets that they're declaring, the revenues are not proportionate, which means that the fixed assets are, are bloated, which means some naughtiness has happened once upon a time, right? Now, companies are clever to fudge it to, so that we don't, we don't get full line of sight. They classify the, the work that's happening as capital work in progress, CWIP, capital work in progress. So that they say, ban rai, sort of factory is underway. Any moment now, it will be coming along. You'll see the revenues. Right? Aaj nahi aaya, it's not arrived, but just be a little patient. You are a long-term investor, no? Show some patience, abhi aara hai, factory aata rahega bhi. Right, so it's called CWIP. The other benefit of booking the expense under CWIP is, uh, under accounting rules, you don't have to then depreciate and hit your PNL. Once you say an asset is built, the accounting rules say you depreciate across 10 years or 20 years, and that hammers your profitability. So CWIP is like a gift from God for, for naughty promoters, right? So if a promoter is high CWIP year after year, as a percentage of their gross block, khatre ki ghanti, danger signal, right? A straightforward danger signal, CWIP to gross block. So this is how, so this is how, again, Amtec Auto, if you, if you see diamonds in the dusk, the Amtec Auto may, is, a, is a consistent problem today, even today, Auto industry has several companies, consistently high CWIP, right? Auto cycle in the gutter, they're still building plants to kingdom come, right? And, and, and you know, you say, sir, the, the, your rival also makes the same thing that you're making. How come that dude is able to make more in his factory than yours? And he will have some, you know, convoluted explanation. You can listen to the explanation or watch them on, you know, TV or something, but keep looking at this ratio, CWIP, as a, as a multiple of gross block, very high, consistently high numbers indicate uh, issues, right? And finally, an obvious one, if the auditor's fees are growing faster than revenues, then, then the auditor is, on the, is, is doing something funny for the company. Uh, you, you and I don't have to sort of uh, beleaguer the point. On that related point, if you keep seeing rapid auditor changes, that's also a, so that's how we spotted man person. One person used to be a glamour stock, and we kept saying that the auditor auditor keeps churning, um, and that's how I ended up avoiding that. Right. So, so you read diamonds in the dust. Uh, read diamonds in the dust. I'll give you another book to read. Read financial shenanigans. If you really want to get into the the guts of how to become a great forensic accountant, and I I showed you right. This is the foundation of Indian investing. Foundation of Indian investing is not some Thor Ford futurology. Foundation of Indian investing is catching the crooks. First off, right? So this guy called Howard Schillett, he's the guru. He's the he's he's been he's someone we've learned from. I think his this is a legendary book. It's in it's in the fourth edition, right? Uh, you can buy it on Amazon, but doesn't matter which edition you get, get Howard Schillett. And uh, if you really want to do investing yourself, then become a master at this, right? Schillett is he, Schillett hasn't written about India, he's written about other countries. So we read Schillett, I read actually Schillett when I was in the UK. So when we came to India, I gave it to my colleagues and say very early on, very early on, we realized that Divan Housing is heading for the rocks. 
uh, courtesy shilit. So for example, in shilit, one of the things that he, he teaches you to look, look for is, does the, does the owner, does the main person in the business have a say in the audit committee? And incredibly, if you read the Diwan Housing uh, Annual Report, it said that the promoter chairs the audit committee. So you sort of read that and you say, well, this doesn't make any sense. The audit committee is supposed to be independent, no? If the promoter chairs the audit committee, it sounds a little strange. And then if we, when we looked, at, uh, we looked at Diwan, we used to see fee income consistently going up. So in lending, as a lender, if you're charging heavy fee income, that should raise your antennae. Because if you charge heavy fee income in, as a lender, will high quality borrowers such as the people in this room come? They won't know. Why will you go and pay a heavy fee income for a mortgage? Right? So as soon as you charge heavy fee income as a lender, you're doing what we call adverse selection. You're going to attract the least, least good quality people. And then as we kept looking at Divan's accounts using Shalit's lens, uh, by 2013, it was evident to us that there's, a, there's going to be issues here. Uh, uh, just one clarification. When I created the slide, or my colleague Salil created the slide a year ago, Divan was in bankruptcy. Since then, it's come out of bankruptcy. It's been acquired by the Piramals. It's no longer in bankruptcy. So that clarification is now owned by the Piramals. Uh, the equity holders got nothing, by the way. The company went into bankruptcy, right? So the equity holders got zero. Um, um, and uh, the promoters are, I think, somewhere, somewhere in Bombay. But from what I keep reading in the papers, they go in and out of, they go in and out of prison uh, on, on, on some, so for some reason or the other, right? Now, the remarkable thing about Divan was not that it went bust. You know, bade bade country mein bade bade lenders to fatte rehte hain. That's a rule of life. But the remarkable thing was retail participation rocketed after it after it became clear that this is going to blow up. Right? It was crazy, right? So you, you see the data, the, the Divan stock price plunges. So I think September 2018, uh, DSP sold some of the bonds, Divan bonds that they had. They sold it basically at a distressed valuation, uh, yield of 12%, which implies a distressed valuation. And you know, once a smart house like DSP sells the bonds, then the rest of the market got wind of it. And you can see the kind of vertical drop in the share price, right? So, so you know, uh, DSP has at least as large a team as Marcel is probably larger. So DSP is selling bonds, retail punter buying shares, right? You can't sort of make it up. Not only buying shares that week, the retail punter keeps buying, right? It keeps buying basically until it goes into bankruptcy. People keep buying the shares. And you can't make it up. You just, you ask yourself, who the hell are these people here? It's say, it, you, you don't even have to do forensic. It's coming on TV that company is going down and there are a bunch of crazies in our country loading up their life savings on it. The same, uh, we, uh, there's a same, similar chart for Yes Bank as well. Yes Bank going down, RBI trying to orchestrate a rescue, retail investor asking me, Sasta lag rahe na? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know what to say, yaar. I mean, you, know, you don't even know. People ask you these questions at the airport or the lift, sometimes in the toilet. What do you say? <laughs> you can't sort of sit them down and say, I'm going to explain you. <laughs> right? So just be careful of this, right? Don't get into this, this situation that it's gone down. A lot of people say, gone down. What do you want to Don't do that. It's life is too short for that. Right? Now, let's get back to the, the, the process again, right? So we start with the BSE 500, do the forensic piece. Then we look for low leverage, right? Um, now, uh, I'll, to be honest, when we do when we do leverage analysis, we do something a little sophisticated. Uh, there's a Python code that our colleague uses. If I want to simplify it for you, here is the way to simplify it. Look for debt equity below 0.5 times. 0.5 can each debt equity. Don't go above that. The only exception you should make is lenders. Lenders naturally need to leverage. But even in the case of lenders, if debt equity is above 10 times, uh, stay away. Uh, typically, good lenders are levered 5 to 10 times. 10 ke upar, I find it a little stressful. Um, some of the large public sector lenders today are running at 20, 21 times debt equity. I don't have the nerve to even get remotely there, right? 10 is as far as my middle class heart can bear, right? Uh, consistent profitability, Roki is the metric that we've written about extensively, at least 15% consistently. You will see the bulk of the Nifty doesn't make it. The bulk of the Nifty doesn't make it. Now, if they were doing, you know, something Elon Musk has, you know, Gadi, which told for something futurology they were doing, I could understand. But people are making, you know, um, during, during civil construction at 10% rookie, 
uh, you know, doesn't make any sense to me, right? If you're doing civil construction at 10% Roki, that's a good service to the country, or you're, off, off, you're offering us telecom services at 12% Roki, good service to the country. But for you and I to make money from that, a little difficult. So Roki above, Roki at 15 or above, right? And then let's move to something that I, I want to talk you through a little carefully because this is an important aspect of investing that historically we haven't quite explained to the public uh, 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 before, right? So you identify a bunch of good companies. Now you now want to invest in them, right? What you need to do is figure out what is the, what is the way that you can rebalance the portfolio. Let me talk you through rebalancing and then I'll explain to you both position sizing and rebalancing. Right? When you think of rebalancing, think of the IPL auction. That's the easiest metaphor for rebalancing. Right? IPL auction is every cricket team, you've seen it on TV, right? Every cricket team sits down, the IPL team sits down. There's a typically for some reason a British dude who, you know, who says, Itne pe player and you know, uh, promoter is there, the lollipop. Each promoter gets a lollipop. Promoter raises the lollipop and then it carries on and until and until the finally the auctioneer says done. You know, uh, uh, Rohit Sharma goes to Mumbai Indians at this price. Right? So every IPL auction is a rebalance. The teams jettison their underperforming players for a price. They buy new players. They think they're buying new players. The, the, uh, the emphasis, the place is, I want to buy good players, but not by overpaying. Right? And therefore, so if you think back to the uh, last year's IPL auction, 2022 ka, when for the first time the Gujarat franchise participated, they bought... Uh, Mohammad Shami, for example, at six crores, right? And uh, by the time the auctions ended, everybody in the cricket uh, online community said the Gujarat people have screwed it up. They've paid too much for, you know, uh, 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 Lockie Ferguson, Mohammad Shami, Shubman Gale, etc. Iska to, they said this team has now overpaid. Uh, uh, basically, they tried to position Gujarat as the as the Marcellus of IPL. And then you and I know what happened next, right? They said uh, they said they overpaid and. Uh, Gujarat Titans dominated every stage of the IPL and ultimately won the IPL, right? Supposedly with overpaid players, right? Um, and this year, uh, this year, many of the Gujarat players, I noticed many of the Gujarat players who were sold, were sold at far higher valuations. The other people who bought them clearly didn't think they were overvalued, right? So, so there must be something happening there. So effectively, when you rebalance, you're trying to do your own Gujarat Titans Vara story. You're trying to bring in new players who are good, but the market isn't recognizing them as such. And you're trying to jettison some of your players who are good, but you think they are fully done, right? And therefore, the, the, the abiding, uh, the, the, the metaphor I keep think going back to is 1983, Kapil Dev and India winning the World Cup. We were a good team. We didn't realize it ourselves. As you, uh, if you watch that uh, movie, uh, uh, 83 and Ranveer, Ranveer Singh, right? Ranveer Singh, ah. Huh? Ranveer Singh plays Kapil Dev and there's a famous scene, right, where the manager books the tickets uh, a day prior to the semi-final. Final chodo. They book the return tickets for the Indian team a day prior to the semi-final. Uh, we ourselves didn't know that we were any good. So uh, why, how would the rest of the world know? And this actually is a very interesting thing. This happens often in India. When I meet small cap companies, often they themselves don't know they're very good. Right? They are, all, they are sort of a little de deflated. And you sit down with them and you say, you look at it and say, boss, you're 1983, you're Kapil Dev. And the promoter says, no, 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 you, you must be joking. And you say, no, look, look at the product, look at the modes, look at the distinctiveness. You can build something very powerful. What you're not trying to do is, you know, buy the duds at the bottom left. Don't do Cox and Kings, D, DHFL or, you know, Satyam, Shatyam. That's the traditional value investing paradigm in India. The traditional value investing paradigm in India is people buying stocks which look optically cheap, but actually end up being darts. What you're trying to do is buy companies which are high quality, but the world hasn't realized that, right? And if you do this every six months, every six months, sit down with the portfolio, look at the stocks, look at the price to free cash flow, and try to say, how do I load up on stocks which, uh, given their fundamentals, given their debt equity, given their ROKI, are at low price to free cash flow? Uh, and how do I uh, reduce some of my holdings where given their fundamentals, the price to free cash flow is very, very high. Now, let's go back to the same flow through again, right? Uh, forensic, low debt equity, uh, good profitability and, and price to free cash flow. So rather than just doing the raw returns, we've now given you the risk adjusted returns. Risk adjusted return is return divided by volatility, right? How much do the shares dance? Right? What you are looking for 
is good risk adjusted return, not just raw return. Why are you looking for good risk adjusted return? Say COVID strikes and your portfolio falls 30%, right? If you're a human being like me, it will, it will lead to sleepless nights. You might even sell that portfolio at the worst possible juncture. So the biggest reason for building a portfolio which is strong on risk adjusted returns is it keeps your nervous system in control. You don't do stupid things under duress. If you do stupid things under duress in India, you'll inevitably sell when you should be buying, right? It's very difficult for a normal human being who's worked hard for his money or who's worked hard for a money not to sell when the portfolio is down 30. So to prevent that hit on your nerves, invest in companies which not only give good returns, but who have low volatility. So returns divided by, returns divided by volatility is the risk adjusted return. So again, we start with the BSE 500 equal weighted, right? 0.33 times, which is actually quite a bad number. That means for every unit of risk, only 0.33, one unit of risk pay 0.33 return, di di diabolical, diabolically bad outcome. As soon as you do forensic, you double it, right? Forensic immediately doubles your risk adjusted return. You'll see no other step in the process doubles. Forensic doubles it. Then you bring in low leverage and good profitability, low debt equity, good Rocky, you, go, you cross one, you cross, that's the threshold that's really important. You need to be getting more returns than volatility, otherwise it's not worth it, no. You cross one, low leverage and good profitability, and then you bring in price to free cash flow as a way to identify which stocks to load up on, and you keep loading up more and more on stocks which are low on price to free cash flow, you end up at 0.33. So you start, at point th you start at point 0.33, you end at 1.23, I'm sorry. You start at point 0.33, you've improved your outcome 4x. You improved your risk adjusted outcome 4x. Now, some of you might say, boss, buy percent, that's not good enough. A lot of people I meet, they say they're getting 30, they're getting 40. Everybody I meet is making a lot of money. Nobody tells me I'm not making money, right? I was stunned to read in the newspapers two weeks ago. Sebi announced two weeks ago that 90% of FNO traders lose money. I was stunned to read that. I thought every FNO trader I'm meeting is killing it, yeah, right? So it was insane that Sebi, the regulator has some other data which suggests that 90% of FNO traders are not making money. But anyway, this is as good as I think we can do in India with our means, 22% long-term returns. Um, on a risk-adjusted basis, you're getting substantially better returns than the risk you're taking. So let me do one last example and I'll bring it to a, I'll bring it to a close. So we own this stock, LTTS, in many of our portfolios, in our qualitative portfolios, in our quantitative portfolios. As a way of disclaimer, I am invested in, uh, in, in, in this through many of Marcellus's portfolios. Um, um, and, and by the way, the disclaimer applies for most, uh, all the stocks we've spoken about so far. They're inside our portfolios. I'm an investor, 10,000 other people, many of you in this room are investors, my parents are investors. So let's come back to LTTS, right? Let me first tell you how a qualitative analyst will do it the traditional Marcellus way. And then we will discuss the shortcut way, the, the quant way, right? The result is the same. The, both result in us buying LTTS in large quantities. But let me first do the qualitative route, right? What will a qualitative analyst say? Qualitative analyst will say that LTTS is an engineering R&D company, right? Engineering R&D means that companies like Amazon, like uh, Airbus, like BMW, like John Deere, they get LTTSs, engineers to come into their offices, their factories, and work on their R&D, their development projects. Why do they do that? Why does, say, BMW or Airbus ask LTTS as engineers? Because LTTS can supply thousands of engineers at the 30 lakh to 30 lakh to 50 lakh, 30 lakh to 1 lakh, uh, 30 lakh to 1 crore price point. As you can understand, in the Western world, for $50,000, you're not going to get anything, right? So, so both from a cost perspective, but also because if I am, say, Airbus and I'm doing every, say, five, six years, I launch a new aircraft, I'll get a one year, one and a half year spike in demand for engineers. For the other three and a half years, I don't need the engineers, right? So why will I just hire a ton of people and then get rid of them one and a half years, right? So both from a cost perspective and from a, a staffing volatility perspective, uh, in Indian engineering R&D companies, of which this is the largest, play a very important role, right? So LNT has 16,000 16, such engineers which they hire from India's engineering colleges, trains them up, puts them on a plane to, to wherever, Chicago, uh, Dusseldorf, etc. And these guys are Indian boys and girls, goes, go and work in these factories. Okay? That's the service. This is not IT services. 
they're not doing uh, they're not doing sap implementation or oracle yeah salesforce this is engineering services it sounds superficially similar but it's a different industry and one rule of thumb is typically where the it services industry is in year 10 engineering services in year 1 so abhi where the engineering services industry today is where it services was in 2010 right is a massive dearth in the west of stem stem graduates massive dearth india produces more stem graduates than i think the entire western world put together lnt hires several thousand of them every year from the universities and the 16000 engineers disperse around the world and make make money the, the revenues are the best part of a billion dollars right they make around a billion dollars of revenue a year right now what are the comparative advantages here right our analyst will say why will why does this company make a roc not 15 not 25 but actually 35 percent the competitive advantages broadly are in three areas first is trust right if you're amazon and you you need an r d team to work on alexa you're not going to be running an l1 process for the subse sasta the cheapest engineer right you need someone who you can trust will protect the ip your bmw your you need people to work on say ev or powertrain you need a trustworthy group of people trustworthy both because they do a good job and trustworthy so that the intellectual property is not is not stolen right so if you look at the data out of the world's top 100 spenders on engineering r d 55 are clients of ltts out of the world's top 10 auto oems eight are ltts clients out of the world's top 10 manufacturing companies who are not in auto non-manufacturing auto companies seven are LTTS clients, right? And you can see the trust because 90% of the business is repeat business. The same people keep coming again and again. And you can see why that is, right? Because of the way technology is evolving, a car is not something that you build now for once every five years. A car is almost like an iPhone. Every six months in an EV, there's a software upgrade, right? And that requires design. And every year, a new, if you look at Tesla, every year, new designs come. So a car and a phone are now very similar. Even medical devices are increasingly similar to the iPhone than the Purana Zamana. So the addressable market for these sorts of players are rising. 90% of businesses repeat, repeat business. Unless the West manufactures a huge glut of engineering talent in the next 10 years, these sorts of companies have a, uh, have a long trajectory in which they'll grow. So that's the first supply, first advantage is, is trust. Second is IP. Right? One of the most remarkable developments of India in the last 10 years. This company is only 10 years old, by the way. It makes a billion dollars of revenue. It was inside, it was inside LNT prior to, the, prior to 2013. LNT is under incubated Hua, but it became an independent entity only a decade back. In 10 years, these guys have got 900 patents from their 90 innovation labs. Right? That's pretty solid stuff. These are not just local patents. These are patents filed in many different countries. You have genuine intellectual property inside these businesses which other western companies want to buy on tap right if you go to the ltts website uh, uh, you'll see the, the ip and the ip becomes the second competitive advantage but the third and perhaps most critical competitive advantage is supply side if you wants to hire several thousand engineers every year can you just stick an advert online and hope that the people come in no yoga right indian engineers now have all the opportunities in the world even in supposedly funding winter, the engineering colleges still are full up on demand, right? So if you want to hire talent from decent engineering colleges, you need to build massive relationships. So every year these guys do something called Tech GM. It's a competition. I think 400 or 500 colleges participate in it. They've been doing this for 10 years. And that Tech GM process where they go to colleges, run innovation contests, uh, uh, build relationships with talented people from their first year in engineering college, the LNT brand, that 10 years of relationship with campus heads, with recruitment heads in colleges, uh, allows them to pull in several thousand engineers every year. You got an army of 16,000 people churning. Assume 20% churn, just to replace your talent, you need 3,200. Your business is growing at around 20%. To then augment that, you need another, another, another 3,300. You basically need 5,000, 6,000 engineers to feed a machine like this. And that's not easy. In any other country, it's not possible. The only country it's possible is in India. We produce 10 million graduates a year. But even in India, even though there are 10 million graduates, for this quality of work, the skill set is, uh, the population set is tight, 
and to pull 5,000, 6,000 graduates, you need supply side comparative advantages, which is what LNT specializes in. So a qualitative analyst, the Marcellus qualitative analyst will conclude the exercise by saying, these are the comparative advantages. The result is ROCs of 35, 40%, 20% free cash flow compounding. We will value it and say, this stock is worth twice as much the current share price. Broadly in that ballpark, the stock is worth twice as much the current share price, right? And our fund manager will say, stock gira hai, I think last 12 months is down 30%. So let's increase the position size, right? What will the quant analyst say? What will the quant team say? The quant team will use the checklist I gave you. They will do something very simple. They'll say first, forensics pe kaha pe hai? Where does LNT stand on forensics? And we will say it passes. It's not, it's not super, but it's decile five, uh, decile five, decile six. The bottom four deciles are the, is the rogues gallery. Decile 7, 8, 9, 10 is the rogues, rogues gallery. This is decent on accounting. Second, debt equity is nil. There's no debt here, right? A IT services company shouldn't need debt. Third, we, the quant analyst will say, uh, for, for rookies of 35.40, for rookies of 35.40, price to free cash flow of 5.6 is superb. For rookies of 35.40, price to free cash flow, you're only paying six times the current free cash flow, right? Uh, that's a superb outcome. And we rock and roll, we go and buy, we go and buy LNT. So you can see how the quant analysts sort of revved the position up. Uh, 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 both approaches are valid. If you have the time, the interest, and it's a passion, do the qualitative approach. That requires study, it requires reading. Read the, read, first understand forensic accounting, then read the annual reports, understand the strength of the franchise, reach your conclusions on why this company will generate free cash flows for many years to come. If you don't have the time because you've got a demanding day job, then follow the simple checklist approach. And I'll go back again on the simple checklist approach. Simple checklist approach, forensic screening, low leverage, low leverage, uh, 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 good ROC, and then finally bring in price to free cash flow, and you're done. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edge. Thank you for giving us this opportunity on this lovely Sunday morning. Thank you.